This is chapter 13, and we will be going over the review questions. In the first question, we have that an allele radical has how many pi molecular orbitals? So an allele looks like this, right? So that's an allele, and we're dealing with radicals. So radicals means that we only have one electron, and let's just put them over here, okay? So that's an allele. But the way I like to work with these kind of problems is that I like to draw the resonance structure. So the resonance structure can look like this, right? So what if instead of on the right side, I have my radical on the left side? So what if my radical was right there and then my allele was right there? Well, you should be thinking to yourself that they're the same thing. What if I had a model in front of me, like a plastic model, and I flipped it this way, right? Well, it would be the same structure. Okay, so let's actually draw um, some eyebrows right here, right? So that's a person. Uh, let's, let's actually draw the resin structure, okay? So I'm just gonna do the three carbons, and, and then I can actually do kind of like a hybrid, right? So this double bond can actually jump between uh, figure one and figure two. So this is going to be like the hybrid, okay? So you can think of this structure as having a double bond there and a double bond there at the same time, okay? It's kind of like a in-between, right? Okay. But now let's actually draw out the orbitals, okay? So since we have three carbons and each carbon has a p orbital, we can actually draw little balloon animals. And sometimes... It's great to just draw balloons, uh, kind of like focus on something else, right? So these are kind of like little balloon animals. And it's going to be the same thing for this structure right here. So I'm not going to draw it again. It's the exact same thing. And let's draw our balloon animals right here. So I'm going to draw a giraffe. Here we go. And the new Sonic movie just came out. So I'm going to draw a hedgehog. There we go. Okay. So now I'm going to be talking about orbitals, and let's do it in pink. Okay, well, between carbon 1 and 2, there's a double bond, and double bonds form whenever orbitals are talking to each other, whenever they communicate. So I'm going to shade out. It doesn't matter which one you shade. Let's say I shade in this one. It could have been the top one. It doesn't matter. Well, since I shade him, and there's a double bond, I have to shade the next one in the same order. So since I shaded the bottom one, I'm going to shade the other bottom one because they're communicating and whenever they communicate, they're going to make a double bond. And so an easy way to remember this is that whenever two people communicate, they make a bond. Okay. Well, be between carbon two and three, the radical, there is no communication. There is no double bond, right? So since there is no double bond, there's no communication, meaning since I have this guy shaded on the bottom, I'm going to shade him on the top, okay? So he's talking, but the other guy is not listening. And so they're not going to be in, in wave, right? They're not going to be in sync. So that must mean that we have a double bond on the first one and a bond on the third one. Okay, well, using that logic, what if on this one I started here, right? Well, there's a bond between carbon 1 and 2, so that must mean that they're communicating. Okay, well, since there's a bond on number 2 and 3, that must mean that they are communicating as well. So since there's a bond everywhere, a double bond, I should say, everybody is communicating with each other. So over here, you only have one node, and that node occurs between carbon 2 and 3. And there are no nodes in carbon... Uh, well, in this structure, okay? So in the question, it's asking how many pi molecular orbitals are there? Well, technically there are three. There are three pi molecular orbitals. How do I know that? Well, in the resonance structure, in the resonance structure, you would have three pi orbitals. This is a pi orbital. So let's call that pi, and then we're going to call that an orbital. And this is a pi orbital, 
as well because um, basically all these structures, this is a pi orbital as well, are contributing to making a pi bond. So we have three orbitals, one, two, and three, three orbitals that are working together as a team to make a pi orbital, okay? So each structure via resonance can do a pi orbital. So there are three pi orbitals. Over here, there would only be one pi orbital, one pi orbital, and no pi orbitals, okay? Because on the first structure, one and two are working together to make a pi orbital, okay? So there are two. But then carbon three is not communicating. So he's not being a team player, and therefore there are no pi orbitals. But if we work together as a team via resonance, then all three carbons can share a pi orbital. So the answer to this question is three. There are three pi orbitals, probably blueberry because I'm writing in bluish purple, three pi orbitals and the allele radical. And as a recap, this only occurs because of the resonance structure. So this molecule has three pi orbitals because each carbon has a p orbital that via resonance can communicate efficiently to make a double bond, okay? So because there's a double bond on each side, you would have a pi orbital. Number two, the allele cation has how many bonding, keyword bonding, pi molecular orbitals? Okay, so the keyword would be bonding, and we have to, again, look at the pi orbitals but instead realize that it's for the allele cation. So here's an allele cation. And the cation means that there are no electrons on the third carbon. Okay, well since there are no electrons on the third carbon, I'm just gonna be drawing my balloons here, right? So here we go. Okay. And, well, does the third carbon have any electrons to give up? No. In fact, it's just connected to a hydrogen, and there are no other electrons. And so the electrons that are present are being used to create the, the carbon-hydrogen bond, okay? So we don't have any electrons to give off. Therefore, we don't really have a, a p orbital here, okay? It's just not going to happen, right? So let's kind of ignore it for right now. Let's ignore it. Okay, so between carbon one and two, there's a double bond, and so they're gonna be communicating. And since they're communicating, we're gonna shade them in the same direction. Now, I started uh, uh, downwards. You know what, let's just uh, do it arbitrarily. Let's say I started upwards. Well, since I started it upwards, the second carbon has to communicate, so he's also going to be talking upwards, okay? So there we go. That's pretty cool. So now you're thinking, oh, you know, we have two pi orbitals. Well, yeah, we do, but how many of them are bonding? Hmm. Well, here's a way you can think of it. Here's a pi orbital, right? And let's put him going this way. Let's put an electron. Now, it's important for you to know that between carbon 1 and 2, there are two electrons. So let's label them as electrons, okay? So there are two electrons, and those two electrons make up the double bond, okay? So let's call this pi 1. And let's call this one pi 2, okay? So there's pi 1 with one electron. And now here's going to be pi 2 with also one electron. Well, they're at a very high energy like this, but if we work together, then we can actually make a stable product. And we can actually form a bonding, a bonding p orbital or pi orbital, okay? So this is a bonding platform. And what happens there is that carbon one says, hey, let's work together. We're gonna go to Raising Cane's or Wendy's or whatever, and I got like five dollars, you got five dollars, we can buy a ten dollar meal, right? And so this carbon gives up its electron and he goes here. And carbon two says, okay, cool, 
we're gonna get some spicy chicken nuggets and we're gonna have a great time so he also donates his electron and they make a bond okay now notice that my electrons were going up and down this is wrong okay don't do that up and up is bad down and down is also bad you go up and then down okay up and down so carbon one puts one electron into the bonding platform and carbon two puts his electron into the bonding platform and so together they only make up one I should say I should actually write that down so we make one bonding orbital and we're gonna do kind of like make the rabbit so he's gonna be very happy very happy he looks so adorable so there we go hopefully that wasn't too hard for you to follow uh, the reason why this third carbon didn't chip in is because he doesn't have any electrons he doesn't have any money to buy any Wendy's right all his money is being used to make the carbon hydrogen bond and the carbon carbon bond Carbon 1 and 2 had a lone pair, and that lone pair became a double bond. So carbon 1 donated a carbon to the bonding platform, and carbon 2 donated an electron. Sorry, the carbon 1 donated an electron. Right, uh, excuse me. So carbon 2 donated an electron to the bonding platform, and together they made one bonding platform. So there are only one bonding molecular orbital, pi molecular orbital. So there we go. Pretty cool. So for number two, there is one. Now, number three, the HOMO, which is the highest occupied molecular orbital of 1,3 pentadiene, has how many electrons in its ground state? So whenever we just create 1,3 pentadiene, how many electrons are in the ground state? Okay, well, we'll give you like a mini lesson on molecular orbital theory. So let's start out with my pentadiene. One, two, three, four and five. Okay, well penta means five, so there are five carbons, but diene means that there are two alkenes. Notice di means two and ene means alkene. Okay, well where are my alkenes? Well alkenes are going to be on carbon one, so let's say one and two, between one and two, my double bond is going to exist right there. That's carbon one and two, three, four, Ooh, let's make that three better, three, four, and five. Now, the second diene is on carbon 3. So between 3 and 4, I'm going to pick the lowest number, which is 3. So that is pentadiene, 1,3 pentadiene. Okay, well, now we have to figure out how many electrons are in this structure. How many uh, are in the HOMO, actually? So here's the easy way that I figured this out. Well, we have five carbons, and each carbon has a p orbital. You have to make sure that you have a p orbital. In this case, we do have p orbitals on all five carbons. That must mean that I have five uh, platforms, is what I call them. So that's platform one, two, three, three, four, and five. Okay, well, those are my five platforms. And then I have two double bonds. Each double bond has two electrons. So I'm going to start from my for my first platform and work my way up to the last platform. So because I have a double bond here, I'm gonna have two electrons. So first, my electron going upwards, and then my, my electron going downwards. That's two electrons. So that is accounted for. Now between three and four, I also have a double bond. Now since I have a double bond, that must mean that I have two electrons. So on the next platform, I'm gonna draw my two electrons. Now, I don't have any more double bonds, so there are no more electrons to spare. All the other electrons are being used up to make hydrogen-carbon bonds and carbon-carbon bonds. The only reason why I have four electrons is because they were being used to make double bonds. I had an excess amount of electrons, so I used them to make double bonds. Okay, So it's just how many electrons you can spare. Right? We cannot spare any carbon-carbon electrons, any carbon-hydrogen electrons, none of that. Those are vital, okay? So that's it. That, that's really it. The highest 
occupied molecular orbital is going to be this guy because this orbital has the electrons. It's the, the highest energy, right? So as we go this way, energy goes upwards, okay? So this must mean that orbital 2 has more energy than orbital 1, right? Okay. And I put my last electron on orbital 2. Therefore, orbital 2 is a homo. Now, these three guys in teal, these three guys are called the lumo, or the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, okay? So those are unoccupied, right? Cool. So the homo has how many electrons? Two. It has two electrons in the homo. And how many electrons are in the lumo? Zero. So Dr. Burhe, or your organic professor, might uh, tell you on the exam how many electrons are in the LUMO for 1, 3, 5 tridiene, or pentatridiene, I don't know, whatever. You're going to say zero, because there are zero electrons in the LUMO. That's what it means, lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. Since it's unoccupied, there are zero electrons. In this case, since we only have two double bonds, each double bond having two electrons, we're going to have two electrons on the HOMO. Which carbocation would be the least stable and which is the most stable? Okay, so which one is going to be the least stable? So teal is going to be the least stable and let's say pink is going to be the most stable, okay? Okay, well, for teal, which one is going to be the least stable? Hmm. If you look closely, I need something that has what? Something that is not near a double bond or even vinyl. Oh, well, look at this. This is going to be vinyl. Okay, so it's kind of like, kind of like OCHEM 1. Remember when we said that if you have something like this, that was allylic, and allylic is really good. So this is really good. It's actually better than a tertiary carbocation. So it's better uh, than a tertiary carbocation. Okay, so that's a lilic. And where do you see that? Well, we see a lilic over here, okay? So here's your double bond, and then we have a gap, and then we have a carbocation. So the way you can think of it is carbon, 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 right? And then carbocation. So this carbon is attached to another carbon, and those are double bonded. And then he's attached to another carbon, but that carbon has a carbocation. And it's the same thing as this structure. So therefore, A, or number one, would actually be the most favored. So this is really good, super good. But what would be vinyl? Well, vinyl is when you have this guy, and we have anything on the double bond, directly on the double bond. So if it was here, this is really bad. So it's really bad. And that's called vinyl. Remember, you couldn't do any reactions with this. No SN1, SN2, E1, E2, none of that. It's really terrible. So why am I putting a carbocation on the vinyl, on number two? See, this is really bad, and it's really disgusting, too. If I see you do this, I'll probably cry. And, you know, that's not that's not a good thing, okay? Um, so for question four... Number one, A, would be the correct answer for the most stable because we have a uh, allylic cation. And number two would be the worst because we have a vinyl cation. Okay, so that's pretty bad. Over here, you just have a primary uh, carbocation. This is a secondary carbocation. This is also secondary. Like, who cares? You only care about the vinyl and the allele or allylic. Number five, which carbocation would be the most stable? Again, 
if you look upwards, we're trying to look for an allylic carbocation. So is this carbocation allylic? No, it's not even near the double bond. It's just a secondary. So that's bad. Is B allylic? Well, let's see. We have a carbon. Carbon, those are double bonded. And then we have another carbon next to the double bond. And it has a carbocation. So that's really good. That's pretty good. Also, it's secondary. Okay, well, let's go to the other one. Well, Brian, this is also allylic, you know? Well, what, what do we do? Do we, like, drop the class? Do we cry? Well, mm, you shouldn't do that because this is actually a primary carbocation. And what do you know? Well, tertiary carbocation is better than a secondary carbocation, and a secondary carbocation is better than a primary car carbocation, okay? So therefore, B would be better than C, even though they're both allylic. So B would be a lot faster than C. And D, well, it's just a primary, it doesn't even have a double bond. So we know D is wrong, and C has to be wrong because the secondary is better than primary. Therefore, B would be your correct answer choice. Which of the following compounds would be the most stable? Well, which one is the most stable? Well, whenever you're working with um, cyclic compounds or rings, if you like that term, if it's conjugated, it's going to have increased stability. Okay, so conjugated means you have a carbon, right? So let's kind of do this. So conjugated means that we have a double bond, blank, double bond, blank, okay? So Number four would be wrong because you don't even have a diene. You don't have any alkenes, okay? You have an alkyne, but we don't work with that. That's wrong. Number three, well, that does have a diene, but do you see any gaps between the double bonds? So is it double bond, gap, double bond? No, it's double bond, double bond. So that's bad. That's no conjugation. Over here, you do have a diene, and you have some gaps between them, but there are too many gaps. You have two gaps. You need one gap. That's wrong. And A, or number one, is that right? Well, I think it's right. Because you have a double bond, gap, and then a double bond. So that is conjugated. Okay? So number one is conjugated. Right there. So it's going to be A, or you say number one. Number seven, consider the both conf configurational and conformational factors. Select the least stable form of 2,4-hexadiene. So the least stable form. Okay, well, if you remember, like, I, I think it was chapter five when we were doing Newman projections, you didn't want your big uh, groups to be close to each other, right? So for instance, if we had two terbutyls, you, you don't want those tert butyls to be crossing next to each other because of steric hindrance, okay? So it's the same thing. I know that trans molecules are going to be really good. So if you ignore these hydrogens, they're so small they don't do anything. So if we ignore those hydrogens, look at my big groups, methane, right? So my methanes are far away from each other, and they're in opposite directions. So this is pretty stable, okay? Well, if we ignore our hydrogens, again, look at my methanes. They're far away from each other, but they're in the same direction. It's, it's not good, but it's not that bad. At least they're not close to each other, right? Okay, well, now our methanes are getting closer, but they're still kind of far away from each other, so it's not that bad, okay? Over here, on number four, this is pretty bad. My, my methyl is getting... Um, really close to the other methyl, but it's next to a hydrogen. So it's kind of like putting a sumo wrestler in front of a rat. It's not going to be that bothered, right? Like the sumo wrestler is really close to the other sumo, but not close enough. And in number five, it's in the worst case scenario. Scenario. Um, now my methyls are right next to each other and they're in the same direction. So they're kind of like rubbing together, they're merging and sliding, they're hitting each other. It's not good. It's 
way too much energy being released and it's not stable. So right here, this would be really bad because my two big groups are right next to each other and they're in the same direction. So this has a lot of steric hindrance. So this is a steric uh, strain, okay? So this is really bad and it's gonna be the least favored. Number five is the least stable. Number eight, which is not an example of resonance. Okay, well, what is not an example of resonance? Remember in resonance, we're just moving electrons, okay? So we're moving electrons, moving electrons, not atoms. Okay, well, whenever you move electrons, the way I like to do it is, well, if I wanna draw a resonance structure, I just move my double bond here, and I'm gonna move my my uh, anion, or it could be a carbocation, two carbons, okay? It only moves two carbons, so I'd be like carbon one, carbon two. Okay, so that must mean that my resonance structure is gonna have a double bond here, that's good, and it's also gonna have the anion here. Oh, that's pretty good. So that is a resonance structure, so it's wrong, because we are looking for something that is not resonance. So number two, look at it my double bond moved to that carbon, and then my ana uh, my carbocation moved two carbons down. So it was one, two. So that is a resonance structure, that's bad. Over here, we don't have any double bonds, but somehow my carbocation moved. How is that possible? You're saying that somehow I ripped off a hydrogen and it just skedaddled? Like, I don't really understand, like how, how does that happen? You know, so number three is wrong because you removed hydrogen and then you somehow added a hydrogen here. We don't have any double bonds to do any resonance structures. So you physically changed an electron, or I'm sorry, an atom. You changed an atom. And that's not good. That's pretty bad. So this is looking pretty good. What about number four? Well, over here, I can move my double bond to this carbon, and I can move my anion to this carbon, right? And did everything else stay the same? Yeah. So that is a resonance structure. Therefore, it's wrong. Therefore, three would have, be, would, would have to be the correct answer, or it could be C. So number nine, which pair does not represent a pair of resonance structures? So it's the same thing as number eight. Well, if I move my double bond here and my carbocation here, we get structure two, which is correct. On number two, if I move my double bond here and I move my radical two carbons to the right, so as one, two, well, I get the second structure, so that's perfectly legal. And what about three? If I move my double bond here and my carbocation two carbons downwards, so it's one, two, well, that's perfectly legal, that it is a resonance structure. And what about number four? If I move my double bond here and my radical downwards, it could have gone here or it could have gone here. Well, yeah, this is still legal, okay? So they're all good. So the answer is gonna be none. So they are all resonance structures. Selects so the structure of the isolated diene. So isolated means that it's not conjugated. So not conjugated. Conjugated. Okay. So which one is conjugated? Well, this is conjugated. We have a double bond, gap, double bond. So this is conjugated, see? We have a double bond, gap, double bond, conjugated. We have a double bond, gap, double bond, conjugated. Now, this has too many gaps. You only need one gap. But over here, you have one, two, three, four, four gaps. Pretty bad, okay? So this is not good. One, two, three, four, five. Five, actually. I don't know how to count. So this is going to be isolated. Over here, you have a gap between the double bonds, so this is going to be conjugated. Number four would actually be the correct answer. Which of these structures... Select the structures of conjugated dienes. Okay, well, conjugated dienes. Right here, you have too many gaps. This is bad. Way too many gaps over here. You have two. That's bad. We have a double bond, gap, double bond. Pretty good. 
we have a bond gap bond also good and those are too many gaps between them so C and D are gonna be your correct answer choice for that one which alkene would you expect to have the smallest heat of hydrogenation so basically small heat is equal to most stable okay so something is stable it's not going to release a lot of heat when it reacts well I know that if you want something that's more stable you want conjugation Whoop. and we're gonna do a different color maybe maybe orange okay so I know that a is not conjugated this is actually isolated and B is also isolated C is isolated okay but what about D and E well D and E are you know well they're conjugated but which one is better which one is better well I'm gonna have to go with E E has to be better because of steric hindrance now in D if we had if it makes you feel better well what if I had a methyl group here and a methyl group there? Well then, they would be sterically hindered. And if you have something that's sterically hindered, it's not gonna be good, okay? It's not good. So, it, you're gonna have a lot of ionic interactions, well not ionic, but like, electronegative interactions, hydrogens bumping into hydrogens, carbons bumping into carbons, not good. But imagine if I had a methyl group here, and a methyl group here. Well, they're trans to each other, and since they're trans, they're gonna go in opposite directions, and they're not gonna have any steric hindrance, okay? So they're not gonna be colliding or hitting each other. So if it makes you feel better, maybe draw out a methyl group, okay? So you can draw out a methyl group, and just remember that trans is gonna be a lot more stable. So trans is equal to more stable. And cis is really unstable. Okay, so your answer choice would be E. Be E, right there. Which alkene on number 13 would you expect to have the lowest heat of hydrogenation? So, which one is the most stable? Okay, well, this one only has one conjugated, so let's put a C right there. This one is isolated this is conjugated and that one is conjugated but this is isolated this one is both isolated and this one is conjugated but that one is isolated but look on number two this guy is conjugated and if we look on the second structure this guy is also conjugated so notice that for number 13 only structure two has two conjugations and the more you're conjugated the more stable you are therefore two would be the correct answer choice so for number 14 it's asking which compound would have a UV absorption band at the longest wavelength at the longest wavelength okay well here's what you need to know for these types of problems for these problems the more conjugated you have, so as conjugation goes up, your wavelength is also going to go up. So the wavelength, um, typically as lambda, goes up as well. Okay, And as your wavelength goes up, you become closer to color. So you go closer to infrared. So the max color that you can see for conjugated system is red okay so closer to red right if you don't have any conjugated systems you don't even have color you have to use a UV light okay so that's kinda what you wanna look out for over here I redrew the structures because I don't like looking at these structures right there those are really confusing so on the exam I highly recommend that you redraw the structures with the proper bond placement okay right so for example on the first structure I redrew the cyclo uh, the dicyclohexene 
and then I have three carbons, so that must mean that I have three peaks, one, two, and three. And between carbon one and two, I have a double bond. So between carbon one and two, I have a double bond. So that's kind of what I did, okay? Now I'm gonna try to find how many conjugated systems I have. Over here, this is conjugated. So I'm gonna draw little X's for a conjugated spot. So that's conjugated. And over here, this is also conjugated. Okay, so double bond, gap, double bond. So there's one right there. Therefore, we have two conjugated spots. Over here, how many spots do we have? We have one, two, and three. So we have three conjugated spots. Over here, how many do we have? One, two. So we have two spots right there. And actually, we don't even have... Um, yeah, we don't even have two spots on the first one. My, my apologies. It's just one spot. Sorry about that. Sometimes I, I don't see the uh, extra side that I have. Sorry. So that's two spots. Over here, let's see. Hmm? No, we don't have any spots right there. Okay. And there are no spots there. So we're going to have zero and zero spots. So I know that four and five are out. And now we just go by how many conjug conjugated systems we have. So the number one only has two. And actually not two, but one. Number three has two of them. So number three has two. And I know that two is better than one, so that's bad. And number two has three conjugated systems. So three is better than two, so three is out. Now it has to be two. So the answer choice is B. As we increase the amount of conjugated systems, we increase the wavelength. And we also increase the stability or stability of the compound. So you should be expecting like, I don't know, like a, a nice color or something. But remember, as you increase conjugation, you increase the wavelength. And as you increase the wavelength, you're going to start seeing some color. Ignoring stereochemistry, the one-to-one -one reaction of chlorine with 1,3-cyclohexadiene at 25 degrees Celsius in the dark and in the absence of peroxide forms which of these compounds? Okay, well, first of all, I want to draw, draw out 1,3-cyclohexadiene. Uh, okay, so cyclohexadiene looks like this. So it's a cyclohexane, right? And on the first carbon, there's going to be a double bond. And then on the third carbon, there's going to be a double bond. So one, two, three, and four. Here's a double bond right there. And we're, 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 we are reacting it with chlorine. And I don't like that. It's more of a chloride. So it's CO2 at 25 degrees Celsius. So at room temperature. What happens here? is that in the Cl bond, uh, I'll show you two, two potential products. So in the Cl bond, one of these bonds breaks off. Okay, so that breaks off making this partially positive, making this partially positive, and he is gonna break off over here. Okay, so this double bond is gonna take him. Now, am I gonna add my chlorine over here or am I gonna add my chlorine over here? Hmm. Well, let's find out. And here's the method that I use. Well, this bond didn't change, right? So it stays the same. But would I rather have a carbocation here? Or would I rather have a car carbocation here? Well, I'd rather have the carbocation right there because then it becomes allylic. And allylic carbocations are really fast. Really fast. And so the only way that this happens is if the chlorine attacks over here. But you have to remember that, well, let's make you red, first of all. So you have to remember that we have another chlorine right there, right? So he's still hanging out. But what happens, and I only know this because we're doing this at a, not a high temperature, but at room temperature. So that's enough for me in this case. So we're not freezing anything. We're not at negative zero 
<laughs> negative zero. It's funny. Uh, we're not at negative five degrees Celsius. No freezing. It's just straight room temperature. So because of that, we're going to favor the thermodynamic product. So the thermodynamic product goes like this. The double bond moves towards the carbocation, and the carbocation is going to move down two carbons. So one, two. Okay, so my carbocation should be here now. So let's redraw that. Okay, so let's redraw that. I hope you're having a great day, by the way. Um, hopefully uh, today will be a good day. Um, you know, I need those good days sometimes. Um, I'll be fine. So here's a cobra cation right there. And now our double bond is right here. Okay. And my chlorine can actually attack this cobra cation right there. This gives me a product such as this guy. So here's my cute baby cyclo hexane, or actually cyclohexadiene, which is super cute. So here we go. Here's a chlorine, and here's a chlorine right there. And that's actually the thermodynamically favored. So this is thermodynamically favored. And I only know this because this occurs at high temperatures. So usually at 40 degrees Celsius, you'll get this or above, but because this problem is at 25 degrees, I'll just say it's a high enough temperature. So thermo thermodynamically favored just means that we have a, an internal uh, alkene. Okay, we have an uh, internal alkene and it's actually a one four addition. So it's one four because it goes one, two, three and four. We added something to the first carbon and we added something to the fourth carbon. So a one four addition is thermodynamically favored addition. If I spell that right, I don't really care. But Brian, what happens if we did this at negative 80 million degrees Celsius? Well, if we did that at a really low temperature like negative 80 degrees Celsius, then you wouldn't have this step. You wouldn't do that. Instead, instead you would get this product. Instead, you would get a chlorine over here and a chlorine over there, and you would still have your double bond over here. And this is actually called the kinetically favored. This is kinetically favored. So And the reason why it's kinetically favored is because of the secondary carbocation, um, sorry, secondary carbocation. So secondary carbocation. Okay? And it's not stable. It's not stable. But it'll do. It's kind of like getting hot Cheetos when you want Takis. Hot Cheetos are not as good. But they'll, they'll do. Um, personally, I, I really like hot Cheetos. I think they're better than Takis, but a lot of people don't share that opinion for some reason. So thermodynamically favored is going to be the most stable. And the kinetically favored is not as stable. Okay. So which ones can form? Well, one and two can definitely form. But in this case, I'm going to say that number one is going to definitely form for our reaction. So A would be the correct answer even though B can also be a possibility. So it's like what, let's say 88% and this will be like, uh, sorry, this will be like 12%. So, you know, not that much of a product. 16, a, thermo, a thermodynamically controlled reaction will yield predominantly what? Well, let's see, would it be the most stable product? I think so. Would it require the smallest free energy of activation? No, because we're using a lot of heat to push this reaction. So it's actually requiring a lot of energy to activate. It could be like 100 degrees Celsius. It's going to require a lot of heat to, react, uh, to, to activate. So it's not B. It can be formed in the fewest steps. We don't know that. It could be like a 16-step reaction. You don't know.
Sometimes it's a one-step reaction. You don't know. So it's not C either. So a product that forms at the fastest rate, actually, no, it's not good. Um, that's actually um, kinetically favored. Okay, so that's bad. So kinetically favored is also the fastest. Okay, and D or E, sorry, the product which possesses the greatest potential energy. Not necessarily, it, it gets weird because then you're gonna have to get into like Gibbs free energy and all that jazz, but it's not it. Um, it's really complicated to explain that. So yeah, it would be A, the thermodynamically favored product is actually the most stable. So A would be the correct answer choice. Number 17, a reaction under kinetic control will yield predominantly what? Well, I just said that it's not stable, so A is wrong. Kinetically favored is not stable. It can be formed in the fewest steps. Again, you don't know if it's 16 steps or one step. You never know. Each reaction is different. So it's not B. The product which requires the smallest free energy of activation. This is true. Notice that we do it at negative 80 degrees Celsius or below freezing. That allows us to do the reaction at a very low energy. Okay. So yes, letter C would be the correct answer choice. Letter D, the product with the greatest potential energy. Again, gets free energy, not that good. And E is the same issue, okay? So these are bad. The answer choice would be C. Number 18, which of the following can undergo a Diels-Alder reaction? So Diels-Alder reaction has to occur with a conjugated system, and it also has to be in a cis, cis um, conformation for the diene. Okay, so diene has to be cis, and not sig, but cis, and also has to be conjugated. Well, you get the idea, it has to be conjugated. Okay, well, is number one conjugated? No. Is number two conjugated? No. Is number three conjugated? Yes. Is it cis? Well, technically it can be cis because you can rotate on the double bond. If we rotate on the double bond, we're going to get some weird product, kind of like this. And I probably can't draw this, but I'm going to try to do it. <laughs> it's like this. And then... Something like that, I don't know. But technically that would be cis, and then you can do a um, deals alder reaction. So always try to kind of twist and turn in your head when you're doing these problems. Like number three, I can twist it. Um, having a physical model would actually help. I can, I can, I can twist it to make a cis uh, structure. So three is right. Number four, this is conjugated. And if I twist it, I can actually make it cis which would be amazing. And number five is not conjugated, it's isolated. So three and four, or rather C and D, would be the correct answer choice. Now we're getting into the Diels-Alder reactions, which are pretty fun, kind of like puzzles, if you like puzzles, I do. Um, the way I work with this is that I redraw the structures. I don't like the structure, I just redrew it into the bond formula. I think that's more, um, you could work with it, right? It's more pliable. Well, over here, I like working uh, with numbers as well. So whenever I see a problem like this, I'm just gonna number it. I'm gonna number one, two, three, and four. And over here, I'm only gonna be focusing on the double bonds or triple bonds for carbon. Okay, well, over here, there's a carbon that's carbon five, and over here is another carbon that's carbon six. So one carbon, two carbons. Okay, well, since I have four carbons and have two carbons right there, four plus two is six. So I'm expecting a cyclohexane, right? So I have two cyclohexanes in my answer, and it looks like all of them have two cyclohexanes. So let's begin drawing the structures. Over here, we're gonna have our base structure, which is a cyclohexane, right? So that didn't change, and carbon two and three right there, so one, two, and three. But what does change is that instead of having this, 
let's draw this. Let's draw one, two, three, four. I'm gonna connect something. I'm gonna connect carbon four and five and six. So carbon four connects to carbon five, carbon five, and carbon five connects to carbon six. And then carbon six connects to carbon one. Okay, so there we go. That formed. So that would be carbon five and six. Draw it like here, five and six. Now between carbon two and three, there's gonna be a double bond. Okay, so that's between carbon two and three. And now carbon five has what? Carbon five has what? Well, carbon five is directly attached to an, um, a ketone. So carbon five should be like this. Carbon, that, there we go, okay. And the same thing for carbon six. So that's gonna have carbon, that, ketone. And between carbon five and six is gonna be a double bond. But how does that occur? And also, it's kinda like a person fighting, so. <laughs> it's weird. Um, so what is your answer choice? Well, let's see. Number four is looking pretty good. Let's see. That looks pretty good. Number two doesn't look good. Uh, you don't have a double bond there between carbon five and six, so that's gonna be wrong for me. Over here, you added the double bond in the wrong um, in the wrong order, so it's in the wrong carbon. That's bad. Over here, let's see. Hmm. Yeah, so number four is gonna be wrong too because carbon six somehow ended up on carbon one, like the uh, ketone ended up on carbon one. That doesn't make any sense. So it's not gonna work for me, right? So four is wrong. And what about five? Well, five is just terrible. It has a lot of double bonds and that's not gonna work for me, okay? So number five has too many double bonds. Therefore, number one, or A, would be the correct answer choice. Again, all I did was I redrew the structures, and then I just numbered them. I connected four with five, and of course five is connected to six. Five has a ketone on it, and six also has a ketone on it. Now, the way this reaction happens is that, first of all, this bond, uh, let's use a different color, because that's a lot of green. Well, one of these bonds, attacks this bond, right? And this double bond attacks this bond right here, okay? So we still have a double bond left, okay? Now this double bond can also go between carbon two and three. So that's what you see. We now have a connection between four and five, and we have a connection between one and six, okay? And also this double bond moved between two and three. Now carbon five just brought a ketone and then carbon six brought a ketone with it. So not too bad. Now in number 20, we're working with like a 3D shape. It's also called a bicyclo compound, okay? Well, bicyclo compounds come from rings. So this comes uh, from rings. Okay, so my answer has to have a ring in it. So that looks good. This is good, and that's good too. Well, number four and five are pretty bad because you're starting with a, a bicyclo compound, and this is bad, okay? So this and this guy are bad, okay? So number four and five are bad. Now you need to have a diene, so you need a diene. Does this work? No, this is bad. That is not a diene. That is an alkene. Now, number two and three, they have dienes, that's good. But they have the same things. They have this guy and that guy. So what's the difference? Well, over here, you have to realize that these guys are going downwards. So these are technically hashes, okay? So these are hashes. And this is what is referred to in the science community as an endo. So this is an endo product, okay, which is really uh, favored. So that's favored. And you usually get it from doing a cis reaction. So a cis reaction, it's gonna be great. Now trans 
is going to give you an exo, which is unstable. This is unstable and not favored. Okay. And it looks like this. It looks like hash. In this example, would be like CO2, CH3, and then like a wedge, CO2, CH3. Okay. So trans in, trans out. If you have a trans dienophile, you're going to have a trans answer. So over here, there's a trans one. Okay. So three is trans. So this is going to be exo, and you're going to be having hash, and you're also going to have a wedge. Okay. So this is bad because this would be up, or sorry, this would be uh, down, and that would be up, which is not good. We want down, down, right? So DD, that's down, down. Well, over here, this is cis, so that's going to give you endo, which is hash, and another hash. So that's going to be down, down, which is great. So number two, or B, would be your correct answer choice. So remember, cis gives you the exo product, or sorry, it's cis give you the endo product, and endo product means that they're going in the same direction, which is favored. Now, trans is going to give you what? An exo product, so they're going to go in opposite directions, so hash wedge. Okay. So which reaction would produce the following compound? Okay. Well, notice that we have two methyl groups right here. So my answer, or I, I should say my diene should have two methyls. This only has one methyl, that's wrong. This one, well, do you see a bicyclic compound? Well, you do. So this came from a ring, came from ring. And since it came from a ring, I'm looking for, well, I'm sorry. This, um, I don't know what I was thinking, really. Um, I, I apologize. So this didn't come from a ring because you don't see any like weird 3D shapes. This is not a uh, technically it is a bicyclic compound, but you don't see any f weird rings. In fact, you have a hexane. So that must mean that it came from an alkane, or I, I should say diene. Okay, so any rings are bad. So rings are bad. Okay. So two is wrong. So it's either three or four. And we know that this is common between three and four, this guy. So we're going to ignore him, OK? The difference is between three and four. Well, this one, technically, they're going in the same direction. So you can think of it as cis. And this one is going to be trans. They're in different directions. So you can expect something like hash, and that could be like a wedge. But the main difference is that they're in different directions. So it's not going to go in the same direction. Four is wrong. We want something that goes in the same direction. So three would be the right answer. This methane would go in the hash position, and this other methane would go in the hash position, thus giving you an, uh, an endo product. OK, uh, number 22, which reaction would produce the following compound. Again, we want something that gives us the endo product. So these methyls have to go in the same direction. OK, well, number one's wrong. Um, number four is wrong, too. OK, so it's either number three or, or two. Well, notice that we have a trans, right? So we need something that's trans. Is this going to be trans? No, that's cis. And we know that cis is going to give us an endo product. And this is trans. And in this case, we want trans molecule. So it's going to be uh, three, or rather uh, cis, right? So this is going to be not cis, I'm sorry, but C. So C would be the correct answer choice. B would give you the exo, or I'm sorry, the endo product. So it would just give you like some hashes. Number 23, which would produce the following compound again? we have some trans molecules. So my methyls should be going in the different directions, OK? So three is wrong, and two is wrong. So one and four look pretty good, just looking at the methyls. And then we want another trans. So this is cis, and that's bad, OK? So number one, we have trans for both the diene and the dienophile, OK? So it would be A. And notice that this is going to be acting as a nucleophile. 
and the dienophile is going to be acting as the electrophile. Okay, so this acts as the electrophile. It's going to be doing the grabbing first, and this is going to be doing the donating. Okay. Which of the following pairs of compounds could be used as a basis for the Diels Alder synthesis of the compound show, shown below? All right. Well, first of all, you have your your diene, right? But then you have two separate dienophiles. So we have two dienophiles? I've never seen that before. And how would that even work? Like, how do you generate so many cyclic compounds from just two dienophiles? I, I don't understand. That doesn't make any sense to me. So one is wrong. It just looks bad. Number two, you don't even have a diene. You have an alkene. So how is that going to work? It doesn't. Okay. So that doesn't work, right? And over here, hmm, well, we're going to have to redraw that. So we have a CH3, CH, CH2, so it's like that. Yeah, see, even if I attacked it, you would have the double bond over here, and you want the double bond there. How is that going to work? That, it wouldn't work, okay? So just drawing that out, it's not going to happen. Plus, how are you going to generate, like, another cyclic compound from this guy? That's not going to work, okay? So 3 is wrong. So 4 has to work just by convention. So let me redraw it. So now we drew the structure, and we have to basically write this out. This is conjugated, so we go 1, 2, 3, 4, and then 5 and 6. Therefore, we're going to make a new uh, bond, right? So it's going to be carbon 5, 6, and there we go. So between carbon 5, carb, uh, carbon 5 brings nothing. Carbon 6 actually brings an ester group with it. So it's going to bring this guy right here. Let's do. So carbon 6, another carbon, oxygen, there we go. Like that. Okay, so that's carbon 5, 6, and re-emphasis this as 4. Okay. And between carbon 2 and 3 is going to be a double bond right there. And these bonds actually disappear. Okay, so there we go. Yep. So that actually would be the correct answer choice. So 4 would be the great, great uh, answer choice, so D. And remember that basically uh, he does the attacking first. This bond goes here, and that bond re-grabs a double bond, okay? And it forms two new bonds, which is actually energetically favored. So you broke two pi bonds, but you formed two sigma bonds, and you formed a pi bond. It's really favored. So 25, this compound does not undergo the Diels-Alder reaction because what? It, it doesn't go under the Diels-Alder reaction because it, it cannot adopt the cis conformation. So it'd be B. So, you remember when you had like a, you had something like this, and you're like, oh, well, this can do a deals all the reaction. It's very slow, but it can do it. Well, why? Well, it's it's diene, right? It's a diene. It's conjugated. So it's conjugated, but it can also be cis. Well, Brian, that's not cis. That's trans. Well, yeah, but if you rotate it. Across the double, uh, across the single bond. Sorry, you can get this, right? And you're used to that. You're you're used to working with this. So because we can rotate on the single bond, but not the double bond, just a single, we can make this into a cis. But the problem with rings is that you cannot twist them. If you twisted it, you would break the wing, the ring, and it wouldn't be good, right? So whatever. Um, double bonds you have, you're stuck with them. You can't rearrange them and you can't twist them. So you can never get the cis confirmation with a ring. You can only get trans. So therefore B would be the correct answer choice. So which one of these dienes is most reactive in the deals alder reaction? Well B would be wrong because that's isolated. D would also be wrong because that's isolated. Now it's either between A and C. Well C would be the correct answer choice because um, if you rotate it that's this way, you can get this guy right here. So double bond, 
and you have a methyl group and a methyl group. And these methyl groups can actually, uh, they can actually withdraw electrons and they can like, it's kind of like a, a highway for electrons. So these electrons can basically go over here, they can go over there, etc. So it is that absence of electrons that drives the force, that drives reaction, I should say. So A, yeah, it could react, but it's going to be reacting slowly. See, they're already happy where they are. They're happy. But for C, since I have the transfer of electrons within itself via a resonance structure, it's going to want to do a reaction to compensate for the loss of electrons. So for instance, I can also do this. Right? And basically, I have this guy right here. Right? So that's a resonance structure. But as these electrons move around, sometimes for a split millisecond, there are no electrons in this area, or this area, or that area, or that area, right? Just for a split second. And during that split second, the molecule wants to react with something. It's actually going to be reacting with the dienophile. And that's what happens during a Diels-Alder reaction. Okay, so it's kind of like the compensation for the lack of electrons. So it'd be C. That would be the correct answer choice. So which of the following dienophiles is most reactive in a Diels-Alder reaction? Well, this cannot happen in a Diels-Alder reaction simply because it is an alkene and not a diene. Okay, so one is wrong. Two is an alkyne. Okay, so it's not going to react very fast. And there are no electron withdrawing groups or donating groups, so that's bad. This is an isolated system, that's also bad. Now it's either between 4 and 5. Well, you're probably saying, well, 5 looks pretty good because it's cis, but look at it. There's only what? Hmm, let's see. Oh, dienophile, sorry. So. Yeah, dienophile, you can react, sorry, with a um, single bond, or I guess a single double bond, just an alkene. But the problem here is that it's just carbons right here. So you only have carbons to work with, and those aren't reactive by themselves. Like, yeah, this, it's going to help, but it's not going to help that much, right? Um, so still, number one would be wrong. Um, over here, again, it's just carbons. This isn't going to work. It's a diene. It's not even conjugated. So now it's either between four and five. So which one is better? You're probably saying, well, it's five because of oxygen. Oxygen is more electronegative. It's going to withdraw more electrons. Therefore, it would be the best. Well, that's true. But look how many nitrogens we have. We have four nitrogens, and we only have two oxygens. And if you look at the periodic table, we have CnOf. Therefore, nitrogen is kind of close to oxygen. If we have a lot of nitrogens, we can outdo the oxygens. So 4 would be the correct answer choice. So D. Simply because we have more nitrogens and that's more grabbing power for electrons. So if we have some grabbing powers, we're going to be hungry to get more electrons. That's why we're acting as an electrophile when we have a dienophile. Okay? So a dienophile is going to want to grab electrons from the diene. And it wants to grab the electrons from the diene because other groups are taking away its electrons. So nitrogen is taking away all the available electrons from the carbons. And there are a lot of nitrogen, so they're going to be grabbing all the electrons that they possibly can. Number five, yeah, you have two oxygens, but they're not going to grab as much. There's only two of them. And number four, there are four nitrogens. They're going to, gra they're going to be grabbing a lot. Okay, so number four for question 27 would be the correct answer choice. Which would be the product for the following reaction? Okay, well, we have some weird ring. Okay, so we have a ring. Therefore, we're going to have a bicyclic compound, which is like 3D. So I know that 1 and 2 are going to be wrong. Number 3 and 4 are going to be kind of like the good guess, right? A good guess. Now, let's try to do this reaction. Okay, so I redrew the structures, and now let's jump into it. 
let's draw our numbers. So one, two, three, and four, and then five and six. I only paid attention to the carbon-carbon bonds. Okay, so let's draw a good six. That's not a good six, actually. There we go. Actually, no. There we go. So that's a six, and basically what happens here is that we're going to be making kind of like a bicyclic compound. And I know it's not going to be intuitive, but here's how we do it. First, we know that we're going to be drawing a, uh, a cyclohexene, right? But it's going to be in this weird cyclic compound. So it's like this. It's kind of like this, that, boom, that way, that way. There we go. Okay, so that's a cyclohexene. One, two, three, four, five, six, right? It's like, it's crinkled. So let's kind of draw like the crinkled right here, kind of like a folded sheet of paper. So it's in 3D. Okay, well, here are my uh, numberings, right? So here's carbon one, two, three, four, five, and six, right? So between carbon two and three, there's gonna be a double bond right there, okay? And carbon five, doesn't bring anything, but carbon six brings um, one of these things. So it's like this way, right? So it's gonna be endo favored. But what about the connection between carbon one and four? So remember that we have something between carbon one and four, right? Let's call that, I don't know, let's call that mm, beta. Right, so beta is between one and four, and it's a carbon. So where's my beta in this structure? Well, beta has to be between carbon one and four, right? Okay, well, to do that, I just have to draw my carbon. So here's a carbon right there. It's like that, right? So if you want something more edgy, it's like this. So there's our beta carbon. I just gave it a beta, it could be gamma, alpha, who cares? I just want you to know that we just have a single point, and that single point came from the carbon be between one and four. So on number three, here's our beta carbon. On number four, you have a beta carbon, and then you also have another beta carbon. How does that happen? How do you get another carbon? That doesn't make any sense. Number three would make the most sense, because that carbon already existed between carbon one and four, and we just connected them, okay? So that's an easy way to kind of visualize your answer. So I recommend drawing one, two, three, and four, and then you have like a little beta symbol between carbon one and four. That just means an extra carbon that's gonna be popping up in your answer, okay? And then you just merge them together. So for instance, this dienify would attack this bond right here, this bond, uh, jumps towards carbon two and three, and this bond attacks the double bond, and you would have your structure, okay? And again, it's gonna be uh, exo, okay? So it's gonna be, uh, actually not exo, but endo, endo favored. So it's gonna be downwards, right? Cool. 29, which of these conjugated dienes can undergo a Diels-Alder reaction? Right here, this is actually trans which is not good for deals alder, so it cannot do it. Again, this is trans, bad. And now you think this is trans, but look at it. There's a double, uh, there's a single bond. So what if we rotate this? What if I rotate that? So if I rotate this, I can have something like that, right? So if I rotate it, this double bond can go downwards, right? So if you visualize it in your head, you just twisted it like a key, and now that double bond is uh, is downwards. And notice that this is actually conjugated. So that's conjugated, okay? Which is really good. This is trans. It's conjugated, but it's trans, okay? Oh, and also it's a uh, cis. Over here, you can do the same thing, right? We can do the exact same thing, but you would have so many, um, you would have like a lot of steric hindrance. I don't know how to necessarily draw this. I guess like here's a carbon, 
here's a carbon, here's a carbon, right? And here's a carbon with methyls. So there's so much steric hindrance. Yes, we can make this into a cis reaction, into a cis diene, I say, but there's so much steric hindrance that it's not gonna want to react. It's, it's not gonna be able to kind of merge together with the dienophile. It's not gonna be able to go because of steric hindrance. So it's sterically hindered. And it won't react as a result. Okay, so sterically hindered, it won't react, not gonna go. I hope these uh, questions helped you out. Hopefully uh, you do well on your exams. And I hope that you have a great day. Uh, just remember that I love you and just keep going. So don't uh, get discouraged whenever things don't go your way, okay? Have a great day and I hope that you do amazing. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.